All right, and welcome to our show today. Very excited today to have Rodney Frank with us today. Rodney, welcome to the show, and uh, look forward to having a, a fun conversation with you. Rodney, you and I have known each other for now for, I don't even know how long. 20 some ish years, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Too long. So, one of my uh, oldest friends, really, and certainly in the work world, one of the people that I've known for a very, very long time. Uh, worked together on and off over that entire time frame. You've helped us, you've kind of made us better, made us who we are today. So, welcome. Excited to have you here today. Uh, just tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and what's been going on in life over the last few years, especially as it relates to COVID a little bit? Yeah, you bet. So, um, you know, I'm a, I'm an IT guy. I've been in the IT industry now for 22 roughly years. Um, started working for you relatively early in my career. Mm -hmm. um, you guys brought me in for an interview one time and uh, uh, it turned out that it, I wasn't a good fit for that job, but you had some work internally you needed and I've been helping you, supporting you ever since. And uh, in relation to that, I guess, um, that's what I still do now. Um, I help small and medium businesses with their I IT strategy and their IT uh, infrastructure. Right. Um, get them set up and, and help them out as they go. Right. Exciting. And you've been doing contract work for as long as I've known you. You've been doing IT contract work now. Yeah, I mean, I, a couple of stints, two or three years in a row where I've worked full time for companies, but I'm always on the side doing the contracting mm -hmm. thing. And that's now been with COVID now been my sort of principal and uh, source of income. So, right. uh, you know, everything's kind of shifted that direction for me, for sure. It's been a good career. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. it's been a good career. And uh, yeah, it uh, puts food on the table and it's flexible and it gives you some options to do what you want to do. Yeah, absolutely. Time, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, uh, the fact that I can pretty much schedule my time however or whenever I want to do most of the work that I've mm -hmm. got to do, uh, you know, it gives me the freedom to be able to step out, grab groceries for the wife if she needs me right. to, to, you know, run an errand and uh, come back and continue working. With COVID and things like that, things have gotten more remote. Um, I've been doing contracts for companies down in the U.S., uh, mm -hmm. more so even than, than up here in Canada. Um, the contract work is still out there, but it's uh, a lot of things have changed in that in that right. world the last little while. So let me ask you this question. Yeah. The uh, and this comes up quite a bit when we're working with individuals, uh, pretty much in any field. A lot of people are they think I need to have a permanent job, and I say, what's the difference between permanent and contract? Other than on a contract job, you know when it's over. On a permanent job, it's usually a surprise. That's so, true. like, what would you say to someone who's like dead set has to be permanent? Well, uh, so I I was part of the oil and gas downturn when I had a mm -hmm. permanent job, and so you know, going through that surprise, uh, I mean, it was it was a pretty big shock. You're you know three, four, five years in the company, you've got a relatively senior position. Uh, company all of a sudden decides to go from mm -hmm. six thousand people to two thousand people, and what are they going to do with IT? Well, right. you're, you're you're out. So, you know, that uncertainty, especially here in Calgary with oil and gas being sort of a big driver in this city, um, that can be something that is a concern for people in that uh, long-term space. The other side of it too is that, you know, once you get into a permanent job, a lot of people find that, you know, two, three years in, you start having personality clashes, you find people that you don't like, you start mm -hmm. building up a little bit of angst towards the company. Yeah. Where in contracting, you really don't have that. You've got the the freedom of setting up, you know, a six month, one year contract. You know, you're going to be dealing with these people for a year. You can keep a smile right. on for that length of time, pretty easy. Yeah. Um, and the rates are better. The um, benefits you have to figure out that that can be a little bit of a struggle sometimes for people. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, you find the right benefits provider, and and really not much is different. Um, salary for me hasn't changed much in the last four years. Um, it's been up there uh, mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. steady rate, uh, and I've and I've been growing year over year, just in terms of average annual income, that kind of thing. Right. Um, so yeah, it's you know it's it's a different world, but it's the same at the same time. It, right. It's got a lot of perks. Yeah, I suspect in uh, you know one way of looking at it is you you are probably better prepared when things evolve and change in the market as opposed to someone who's done a three year stint and you know, and now they're, they've lost their dream <laughs> and they're gone and now they have to deal with, you know, being let go. And, but for you that, you know, you're on again, off again, you may have multiple roles going on at the same time and you're more flexible. Yeah. And you know, the, one of the cool things about that actually is that, you know, when you're, when you're in a role for three years, 
you're, you're in that same infrastructure for three years. And in IT, especially with sort mm -hmm. of the pace of technology and things, you get locked in. You, you forget about all of these other things, cool things that are going on in IT. Right. Whereas when you're a contractor, having these little shorter stints, you, you're not locked into one infrastructure. You get to see 20 different people in the way that they do things. Right. And so you get a lot broader exposure to different things too. Yeah. What's the Calgary market like specifically? For contract work and specifically. Yeah, well, and contract in IT, um, I mean, it's a lot more of it has become remote. Mm -hmm. uh, you find that uh, customers are looking for you not to come into the office. They don't mm -hmm. even want they don't even want to interview you in the office. They'll they'll do all the interviewing and everything remote. Um, contract lengths have gone down. So what used to be sort of one year contracts or six month contracts mm -hmm. are now three month or six month contracts. Right. Uh, there's a little bit of nervousness just around putting on big contracts and, and longer term projects because of the uncertainty in the market. But rates have stayed relatively stable. Um, mm -hmm. they've, they've gone down a little bit, but not by much. Um, and uh, I mean, they're more flexible. Uh, you know, if, if they, if you tell them, Hey, yeah, I can only work half time, but I'm willing to do the three month contract with you and, and wrap up the work in that period of time, th there's no reason why they won't, uh, you know, work with you on those different pieces. Right. Of it, right. Absolutely. I think I will position this as the oil and gas retreat. Uh, you know, Calgary certainly has lost a lot of uh, business in its downtown and, you know, across the board in Alberta, oil and gas has retreated. How has that affected the contract world for not maybe, maybe, you know, more than just IT, but, you know, specifically IT, but what else maybe you're seeing and how has oil and gas retreated affected you? Yeah, so, I mean, the retreat um, on the oil and gas side has definitely sort of brought rates down uh, mm -hmm. more in line with what an IT guy would be making anywhere else in the country versus mm -hmm. that sort of higher level that people were used to. Um, in addition to that, though, um, what we're seeing is a lot of people are, are taking on second and third contracts mm -hmm. at the same time so that they can have that sort of second set of income to kind right. of help balance things off. You might have a six-month contract, but it might not be steady. It might be sort of half-time. Right. And then you get a few three month contracts in the mix that you can use to sort of fill in the time. And that's sort of one other thing that's sort of changed or become a little more prevalent uh, with right. contract work right now. And I think one of the things that's important to recognize is that within contract and people who are not familiar with contract, they hear about contract work and they think of Upwork, Fiverr, you know, and they think of someone's in a different country and they're punching code. And that's not contract in its entirety. That's just a piece of contract, right? That's that's almost, uh, they, they used to have a, a, you'd have a portfolio and you'd kind of present yourself yep. as like an option for people. Um, it's not that, that's not mm -hmm. contract. Contract work is, uh, you know, an established length of time. It's an established uh, project or whatever that you're being signed up for. Um, there's definitely a known, you know, quality that you're being looked at for in terms of project management experience or, or things like that that are maybe not right. necessarily directly IT skills. And, uh, and they're very, they're very well written. They're very formulated, con uh, you know, signing the contracts, you're signing NDAs and things with these people. Mm -hmm. It's not sporadic work. And what you typically will find too, is that once you've done one or two contracts with a company, um, chances of them bringing you back for a third sure. or fourth contract are very high because they, they get used to the quality of work. They right. get used to the, uh, the way that you present things. And uh, those things can become almost full time in a sense because right. they'll, you know, they might give you a six month hiatus where they're trying to figure out their their next budgeted project, but then mm -hmm. they'll bring you back. And, and so you do a lot of repeat business. Right. So other than if you were giving someone advice who's just wanting to jump into contract work, you know, what do you need to prepare for? Is there anything that you need to do or plan or what do you need to do? Well, you, you need to have an incorporated company. Uh, I mm -hmm. mean, there's some of those basic fundamental things that you need to set up. You need to have an accountant who mm -hmm. sort of understands your line of business. If you're an engineer, they have to understand some of the extra engineering write-offs yep. and things like that that are out there. Um, an IT specialist, if you're in IT, that kind of thing. Um, but generally, outside of those two things and having a resume that shows that you've got some experience in a particular area, that's it. It's it's a pretty easy start uh, for, for getting right. into contract work. Hmm, that's pretty great. Yeah. So, um, Helps to have a partner too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Somebody yeah. who's helping you look for those positions because yeah. not always, you know, right out of the gate do you have that network of people that you can kind of draw on. I mean, that's something you build up over time. So yeah. a lot of times those start with staffing agencies and stuff like right. yourself. So. And so you've worked with 
plenty of staffing agencies over time. What What's the best way to work with a staffing agency to make sure that you get acknowledged and recognized for your skill, that you're not on the other side of the coin harassing them to get you a job? What's the What do you think is the best way to work with them? You know, what I what I find is just sort of the the once every six months check in, you know, right. it, it's uh, it's setting up a, a time to, to pop an email out to those four or five companies that you might be working with. Let them know what your new status is or when mm-hmm. your next contract is coming off and, and when you're going to be starting to look again. Um, and then, you know, working with them to see what's out there, uh, just you get the feelers from them as to what what is contracts doing right now is it are things right. slowing down are they speeding up are, are people looking for this type of work right now you know do i need to take a one or three month break just to kind of wait it out until there's more work in that particular area um and then once you're sort of actually in line for a contract then it's just a matter of keeping touch with them you know if it's right. once a week just popping them in to say hey just wondering what you've heard back from the client yeah. Uh, you know, keep me in the loop. And, and that's it. Like you just, you want to keep it simple. You don't want to send them a six page long right. email and, and, and harass them for what the next step is and who yeah. to talk to. And do I need to send more? And no, just quick check in, brief check in, right. status update. My, you're good yeah, to go. my experience has been that if you're the right person for a contract, you're definitely going to get a phone call. Exactly. You yeah. don't have to hound them. No, they're no. going to hound you Yeah, all day long. They will. And, and uh, you know, that, that company that is has found you and thinks that you're the right fit, you know, they're, they're going to want to work with that recruiter to get you on board as fast right. as possible because they don't want you to find that next contract right. and then be off the market. So, yeah, yeah I mean, you still want to you still want to poke them every once in a while because sometimes the recruiters do forget, you know, to, to follow up or they, they don't have it in their calendar or something like that. But you just you want to make it as infrequent as possible. Yeah. You know, check in with them once or twice. If you don't hear anything back, assume that things have gone to the wayside, focus somewhere else um, and just keep networking because really that's your biggest skill set is just mm-hmm. to just to not abuse people, but to keep them in the loop as to where you're at. And then people can help work for you. Yeah. Right. And I, I think when I look back over having done this for a long time as well, and I look back at some of the contractors that we've really enjoyed working with you included uh you know it becomes this kind of back and forth synergistic relationship we may not have a role for you today or in a in a month or even six months but then you may have some information you may say hey look this interesting company is looking for five or six people maybe it's up your alley and it becomes this back and forth relationship and i think sometimes some people uh they get on the horse and they just think get me a job if you don't get me a job, I'm mad at you now. And it's like, it doesn't really work that way. It's a bit, bit bigger than that. Well, and this is this is part of the uh, the networking conversation, right? Yeah. Is you know you've you've got this relationship with a staffing agency, and a lot of times when you're on a contract, you might be there in the early stages, mm-hmm. and they might be looking to bring on five or six more people with a specific skill set that maybe you know the staffing agency can help with, right? And so you know just keeping them in touch with that kind of situation as well, you know, once you're placed or once you're out of contract, and letting them know, hey, we're going to be looking for like six database people here coming right. up pretty soon absolutely you know there's staffing people have a better pulse on what's going on in the client side of things too in the candidate side of things sorry uh, you know they, they know okay well we've got a big yeah. pool of database people right now or no we don't but we can look that direction for you if that's what you see coming up so maintaining that side of the relationship mm-hmm. too is pretty important uh, there's been a number of times where i've seen a posting go out by a, um, a staffing agency or they've called me and said hey are you in the market no but i know a guy and right. you know you can you can link them up and and hook them up with uh, with that candidate who might be a good right. opportunity and they're going to think highly of you for that and Absolutely. the next time the contract comes up that they have and you're free you'll be one of the first ones they call yeah. so absolutely yeah. when you think about you know, doubling back to Calgary, you think about Calgary, you know, and how it's evolving. Where's Calgary's viability now? We've we've seen a reduction in oil and gas. Uh, we've seen our downtown is vacant. fairly empty. I don't want to say it's completely vacant, but it's not feeling like a busy place. Um, what's Calgary's viability going for? What's the next, you know, five or 10 years? Where do we see the business 
as it relates to IT and IT contracting? Yeah, so I mean, what I'm seeing is a big shift where a lot of the IT work used to be primarily with these big oil and gas companies or these well-established companies that have been doing work for hundreds of years kind of thing. You know, it's now moving into these high-tech startup companies. There's a lot of um, high-tech companies that are coming into Calgary. They've got a fresh idea for some new sensor device that they're going to create and they'll uh, set up shop here and it might be Mm -hmm. a little five person company, but they need help or support with a particular aspect of IT. They need to figure out how to set up their and establish their networking, or they need to figure out how to set up a few servers in the cloud or those types of things. And so these small startups, while they're small now, uh, you know, as they grow or as they start to blossom and turn into companies that are mid-sized companies Mm -hmm. and they start needing real IT, um, I'm seeing a lot more of the contract work going that way. So that you'll help them get started and you might disappear for six months and then all of a sudden they've doubled in size and now they need some new piece of IT and so they're coming back to you and saying, hey, right. we're ready to move on to phase two. This is what we're thinking. Where do we go? Right. So, uh, you know, where it's where it's not the big companies anymore and the big dollars and the big, you know, projects, you know, one year, two year contracts and things like that. These small companies still need a lot of help and support. And while the government has been doing what the government does, these small companies are starting to set up and they're starting to flourish. And, right. and we're seeing some of that in the industry now where these companies are starting to do their du- their doubling or they're, they're going out for the next phase of funding. And so they're looking to grow things in that infrastructure yeah. space. Here's a, here's a tough question. Sure. You may not even want to answer. You may say, I'm not going to talk about it. We talk a lot about Calgary's got these amazing IT resources and one of my fears over the years has been that we've been so focused in on oil and gas and we've been really good at it. Then a new company shows up and says, this is what we do. And I think at a political level, we want to say, look, entirely transferable skill set. And I've always wondered, is it really like, is it really a transferable skill set or do we have to go back to school perhaps? Do we need to do some re-education and realigning with what's here now? Because I I don't think that you can take someone who's spent 10 years working at a large oil and gas firm doing one thing and say, you can work anywhere now that does IT. You just have to have the letter IT in your name and you're good for anything. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, that that I will speak to because there's definitely retraining that's involved. So when you think about these large oil and gas companies, you have a systems administrator who's been there forever. He knows Windows operating systems mm-hmm. inside and out. He knows the servers. He knows the infrastructure. You know, he he's got sort of his piece of the big the big pie. Yeah. And these small startups, that's not what they're looking for. Right, exactly. They're looking for cloud only. They're looking to develop only in the cloud. Um, They're looking for people who understand how to scale out really quickly and how to Mm -hmm. shrink really quickly because a lot of these startups, that's what they'll do. They'll scale really rapidly. They'll blow out this service while they've got five or six big customers. And then they might drop down and have a few mom and pop shops and stuff. And so they need to scale that infrastructure back and, and reduce their costs. And that's a whole different skill set. That's mm-hmm. that's the cloud. That's that's um, you know it's it's talking about grid computing. It's talking about Internet of Things, and you know you're talking about microservices. You're talking about custom applications. It's not you know the big monolithic SAP or Oracle yeah. you know coming in. It's it's these other little tiny cus- uh, tiny applications that you mm-hmm. need to connect together. There's a whole different way you look at that. So retraining definitely. Yeah. Do we have the educational environment in Calgary? To, to help with that? Like, is that something that we should be saying to government? One of the things that will move us further down this, down the field is going to be educational systems to help. You know, what, what we're finding is that there's a lot of people stepping up in these large organizations like Microsoft who have their own cloud infrastructure and stuff. And they're they're stepping up big time in terms of the, uh, you know, online content okay. and things that you can get in touch with. Um, it's important to have those contacts with those companies because um, without them, you lose out on that. It's, it's right. not something that's there and the government's putting it on like a big sticker, mm-hmm. you know, come get educated here. It's right. something that's sort of a back channel that if, you, if you're connected with the right people and you're connected with the right knowledge, it's there. It's just hard to find. Right. So definitely like from a government perspective, if they were to step up and start introducing some of those programs at the University of Calgary mm-hmm. or, you know, at SATE or... or Royal, uh, you know, Mount Royal Uh University, any of those places, um, they would have a big uptick in people that would take those courses. But I think, uh, you know, 
in the meantime, it's kind of finding those little niche things and, and it's who you know, it's not what you know in sure. this industry. Yeah. And of course, there's a lot of self-study, you know, and that and you kind of bring that up a little bit with, you know, the stuff that's online. A lot of the cloud software that we're working on right now, it doesn't come with a manual. There is no manuals. You got to go and do the YouTube videos and figure Welcome it out. to open source, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, you get these big you know, thousand developer, you know, yeah. groups that are spread out across the world and they're all yeah. submitting their code and things. And where do you read up on the manual for that? Yeah. Nobody that's a developer likes to document. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different world. Now, listen, you mentioned, uh, you know, kind of the secondary business marketplace. And I kind of tickled it by saying Fiverr and and Upwork and those sort of things. And so tell me about your experience now. This is may shock some people. <laughs> so uh, many people who know me even don't know that I've ventured into voiceover. Mm. So when I was back in high school, um, my first year of high school was drama 10, drama 20, advanced acting 15, 25, 35, and typing 10. I didn't do any core mm. subjects. I didn't, math, what do you need math and science for, right? You know, so, I, in recent years, have been trying to go back to some of that and uh, and get my creative juices flowing because, right. you know, on the IT side, things can get a little bit stale sometimes. You, you get into the same contract over and over again and, yeah. and you're doing the same thing. It's hard to break out of that. So having a secondary income where, you know, you can pop on to like a Fiverr or an Upwork or in the voiceover world, it's Voices.com right. or Voices123. Okay. You know, they, you, you can, you can sort of have that presence there. Um, and in the evening, once you're done all your IT work, you can hop into the sound booth and right. record a few auditions and send them off. And you never know, it, it helps. Uh, you pick up a few little side contracts yeah. here and there. You, you were casting for Mufasa, I heard. <laughs> no? No, not Mufasa. <laughs> I Close. do, I, I do have that sort of deep, uh, yeah. you know, voice that's sure. that's good for movie trailers and things like that. But what I actually do most frequently um, is educational videos. So, okay. a lot of companies because they're moving remote now, they have a lot of e-learning that they do. So right. they're they're trying to educate their people through, um, you know, Zoom and other platforms like that. But they have this recorded content that they need to figure out how to narrate or how right. to how to do that. And so narration uh, you can tell by how long and verbose my answers are mm -hmm. i like to talk right. and so perfect yeah it's a good matchup for me <laughs> yeah now and you know obviously there's going to be people who have never even heard of this but there is literally thousands of different things that someone could do and it can be done in the evening it can be done on weekends and it can be a full-time job and people are making money doing this all over the world Absolutely. Yeah, that's the way it's working. Yep. Yeah. It's a neat system. There's a, there's a lot of um, difference in how that stuff works. Like it's now about your talent pool versus, mm -hmm. you know, specific skills that you have or lengths of time that you've worked with companies. Right. Because for, for as an example with the voiceover work, it's, it's, I like your sound, you right. know, and that's not really something you can put your on talent. a resume. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not some, something you can put on a resume. It's, it's, You've just got that quality that they're looking right. for for their project. And so, you know, those those websites are kind of valuable in that regard to right. try and help figure out that because you can't like, how, how would you market as a staffing agency? Somebody's voice, yeah. right? Like yeah. you, you have to bring Send them into a clips. podcast like yeah. this and then like fire those, you know, sound clips off yeah. to everybody, you know, and. You know, right. I, I don't know. It, it wouldn't. It's not really the yeah. right way of doing it. Whereas a company can come on there, they can post their job, what what the project is, and right. if you like it, you can bid on it and say, "I, right. I do that for three hundred bucks." Or probably or anything creative is hard to very much pitch. so. Unless you see it or touch it or hear it, so yeah. yeah, even even for engineering, like I know that that's one of the one areas that uh, a lot of the um, staffing companies kind of delve into. That's it's a hard one to, to staff because that is a very creative uh, yeah. endeavor as well. Yeah, so it's a it's a neat big place, and I guess the the point we double back to as well is that. You know, the Upwork, the Fiverr, they're not replacing the traditional contract no. environment. It's a supplementation, and it's. It's a, uh, you know, it's a world where the smaller things can be done right now. Yeah, exactly. Easy, so. Well, and you'll, you'll see a lot of those contracts, they'll pop up and yeah. within 10 minutes, they've already yeah. found the voice they want to work with and found the, and the contract's gone. So right. like, you know, if you're looking to pick up something quick, dirty, cheap, finished, sure. yep, just go and do it. Yeah. But if you're looking for those three or six month contracts, you know, you got kids yeah. to feed, you got a roof to keep over your head, yeah. Fiverr, 
can get you there, yeah. but you have to be there for hundred dollars at a time. Yeah, exactly. Hundred dollars <laughs> at a time. It can be tough. So. Well, and and you get that means you got to find four jobs in a day to right. to get to a salary that you know is that reasonable, makes sense. right? Yeah, so. absolutely. So, well, listen, our time's about up. You bet. It's been great having you. Love having you. Love being able to work with you, and continue to work with you. Maybe we'll still be doing this. We'll do a quarter century check in. <laughs> <laughs> Every few years we'll uh, jump back into this. But Great. thanks again Rodney, appreciate you having you and look forward to having you back again. Appreciate the time. All right. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye.